Hey everybody, uh, welcome to another episode of Storytime with Bucho. Uh, today I'm going to be reading a book that was very influential to me while I was writing my first book after grad school. Uh, we're going to be talking about Blake Butler's There Is No Year. <clears throat> um, i got to give a quick shout out to my friend Shauna, who thought that I should read something that was probably a little more relevant to things going on at the moment, and she was right. And what I wanted to do was dive into uh, Roberto Bolaño's catalog of books. Um, he's an Argentinian writer, or he was, he's no longer alive. Um, but he, a lot of his narratives focused around either the time of Pinochet being in power or the um, after effects of him being in power. Um, and so it's kind of a lot of narratives revolving around the, just kind of that destructive tyranny that happened uh, during his reign. Um, but it's been a while since I read Bolaño, and I wanted to read something that was appropriate for the moment, uh, and I just couldn't find one yet. Um, so that may be the next episode, when I've got time. But <clears throat> for now, uh, There Is No Year feels like a very appropriate kind of approach to 2020. Um, I think a lot of us feel like the year has been wasted, uh, in some ways, or it's just one of those years that we're hoping to forget at some point later on in the future. Um, Blake Butler does a lot of really interesting stuff linguistically, which is why I was really drawn to his first book, uh, not his first book, but his previous book to this, Scorch Atlas. Um, he does some really wild things with prose um, that really tickled my brain in the right kind of way. Um, so he became a, a really quick author for me to latch on to uh, because I really liked what he was doing. It was different. Um, the narratives were vivid, uh, surreal, um, and still there was, uh, there was still some, uh, there was still a plot happening, even if it may have taken a little more work to latch on to. So before I start, I want to read what the inner flap says about this book. Um, because if I start reading it, you, you may get confused, because um, <clears throat> that's, that's just the way he works, um, much to his credit. So, a family of three, father, mother, son, a house that gives them shelter but shapes their nightmares, an illness that nearly arrested the past and looms over the future, a second family, copy family, mirror bodies, events on the horizon, a hole, a box, a light, a girl, holes in houses, holes in speaking, holes in flesh, memories that deceive and figures that tempt and lure and withdraw. <clears throat> now this came out in 2011, so it's been out for a while, um, still easily found, so you should be able to find a copy if you end up liking this. Um, he actually just put out a new book called Alice Knopf, uh, which I've not yet had a chance to read, but it is sitting on my coffee table ready to be read when I've got the time. Um, so if you like this, you will probably like that. He also has another book out called 300 Million, which is an unbelievably ridiculously good account of detectives like breaking up an incredibly violent sociopathic cult. Uh, it's, it's, I'm not going to do it justice. It's, it's a wild ride. Um, and it's told in his typical surrealist style with just very vivid language. Um, definitely worth a read if, if you like to be surprised um, and shocked. Um, yeah, so let's get started. For years, the air above the earth had begun sagging, suffused by a nameless, ageless eye of light. This light had swelled above the buildings. It caked on any object underneath. This light, unlike most other light, outside itself could not be seen, could not be felt impressed upon each inch of air and body. It had no length, no temperature, no speed. Each day the light grew gently thicker, purer. Each day still felt the same. Its presence rode in ridges on the faces of the hours and in silent hair all down all arms. At night the light would be called dark. Among the dark the people staggered, aligned upon the air with hidden halls. In hidden halls they bumped and built their homes. Each of these homes, no matter how small, held at least several outlets, doors, and bulbs. 
in each home as well several people, each fit with further holes inside them too. Through these holes the light could enter, thereby maiming, thereby age. Inside the light and homes the people made more people. The light, unlike the people, went on and on. <clears throat> Controller. The father and the mother sat close together without touching. They weren't sure which way to aim their heads. They remembered recent rooms from other buildings. The house still felt so new. They'd been sitting on the sofa for a long time. Neither felt sure just how long. They'd come downstairs to watch a movie, both with a certain one in mind, something they'd each seen once somewhere, though not together. Now they could not remember. The father felt too warm in this small room. He put his left arm around the mother, felt uncomfortable, took it back. He tried resting the arm on his knee or on his belly. Still not right. What if he could remove the arm, the father wondered. If he could remove the arm, he'd do it. This was the arm the father used most often to take his son or wife at certain soft times by his or her own arm, or other times to masturbate himself or eat. The mother wrung her hands and flexed her neck and saw the ceiling. There was something about the ceiling. She hummed a song, a certain song. She thought she was making it up, but she wasn't. The father stood up. The father sat down. The father picked up the controller for the TV. He held it parallel to the floor. He turned to a channel that came in slanted. He turned to a channel that was not there. He mashed many other buttons, angry. The button's digits formed a certain sequence. The father turned the remote towards his head. He pressed off. He pressed off. He pressed on. He pressed off. He pressed mute. He pressed off. He pressed off. The State the father had bought the house with paper money. He'd worked for years and years. If asked, he would say he could not say for certain what the work was. Mostly all he did all day, any day, was look into a blank screen flush with light. Sometimes the father looked at porn or ads or sports scores, but mostly just the light. In the nights before the new house, the father walked up streets peeping through glass. He'd seen the light in other houses. He'd seen other people in other in their beds sometimes moving in the darkness to the bathroom or the stairs. He'd seen so many bodies fuck. In one house, he'd seen someone reading about a father at the window in a book. All the houses touched by wire. The grain in the glass and the windows and the frames and the walls and the rooms and the houses on the yards along the streets aligned for miles. The father wanted a certain kind of life to give his family. He wanted a house described by all of who he'd been though who he'd been to him would not stop changing. The father washed and washed his hair. He tried. He concentrated. He had not asked the mother or son what she or he thought before he signed the family name on legal lines. He could not remember where he'd found the listing. He could not remember what he did not remember, nor would he want to, would he ever. There were many things the father did without his wife's permission, things like seeing, walking, aging, things he could not name. From outside, the new house looked like many other houses. Copy Family When the family came to live inside the new house, they'd found another family already there, an exact copy of their family, a copy father, mother, and son. The copy family members stood each in a room alone, unblinking. The copy family would not speak when spoken to, though they had heartbeats, they were breathing. Their copy eyes were wet and stretched with strain. Their copy skin felt like our skin. Their copy hearts beat at their chests. The father flicked the copy father on the arm there by the window in the kitchen, the window where, on so many coming days, the father would look out into the yard, the yard where once the copy family had surely moved and laughed and dug and thought and fought and seen the sky change color. The father watched the copy father flinch. The copy father's big ring finger had 13 copy rings on it. In the copy father's copy eyes, the father could read his other's current scrolling copy thoughts. This is my house. This is our house. This is where I am. What else could they have done? The family took the copy family and they set them on the back porch. The father carried the copy father and the mother the copy mother and the son his. 
The skins of the two families smushed together, grunting. Their sweat became commingled. The copy family members did not wink or speak or cause commotion. They did not jostle in their stance. The only thing that made the family different from the copy family was instead of teeth, the copy family's mouths were lined with mold. As well, the copy son appeared exhausted, sticky. He had dark meat around his eyes. The copy family's breath came out cold and made no sound. The son wanted to play dress-up with his copy body, but the father smacked the son across the head. The father hated when the son played girl games. The father bought the son a new neon football for Christmas and his birthday every year. The father also bought the son a football on the father's birthday, a form of begging. Sometimes he found he could conceive, he could convince the son to come out into the yard, though no matter how soft the father threw the ball or how close they stood together, the son could never catch, even right there, even touching. The son's hands and fingers always itched. Sometimes the itching spread into his knee. Sometimes the only thing about the son at all was all the itching. The son was older than he looked. Pretend to not be there. In the new house rung with coarse light, the father locked the doors and sealed the eaves. He had the family play pretend to not be there. They waited to see if the copy family would simply disappear or go away. They waited several hours, peeping. Later, they hooted and shook their arms, made fire. The copy family would not retort. The mother found the copy family's TV dinners in the freezer, and off the floor the family ate. The frosted veggie medley, veal cordon bleu. There was even a little cheesecake wrapped in black plastic. The family felt run through. They felt their bodies rumble, squealing. The copy family outside in the night, the father, mother, and son, each with one wall between them and their copies, eating. The father sent the son to bed. He and the mother went with the son into the certain room they'd let the son himself select. He could have had many other rooms. The bed was deep and clean and padded. The parents took turns kissing the son on the brow, the wrists, the thumbs, the mouth, the teeth, the back, the stomach. The son went right to sleep. Just after, in the hallway, the father touched his hand against his lips, feeling for the cells that had come off in transference, what parts of himself he'd left upon the son. It gets darker, it gets weirder, um, it gets fantastic. Um, it's a really good read, and weirdly, Butler likes to utilize um, a lot of blank space on the pages. So it's a quick read, even though it's something like 400 pages, I think. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, about 400 pages. Um, and Blake Butler is also the founder of a website called HTML Giant, who went dark for a while. Um, they're a literary publisher um, specializing in a lot of strange fiction, uh, a lot of really good fiction. Um, but now they just came back to life this year, um, so that's pretty exciting. It'll be fun to see what they end up putting out. But uh, I will put links to all that stuff in the comments. So um, if you have anything you'd like me to read or you think I should check out, please leave a comment. And yeah, thanks for watching. Bye.